three, two, one, and we are live. Welcome back, everybody, to my show, Classical Christian Thought. This is Eric Ibarra. I am joined once again with uh, Sean Luke. He's a uh, he's a, a getting some uh, waves out there in the in the. Uh, He's right behind Gavin Orland, I would say, in the uh, in in gaining traction in the um, from the Protestant uh, reform uh, re retrieval of history point of view. Um, he's a very very sharp guy. Those of you who've watched my show before, you've probably seen him before, so um, I won't introduce him any further. But welcome back, Sean. How are you? Yeah, yeah, it's good to be here. I actually just saw Gavin. Uh, at he was actually up at Trinity for the theology conference, so we just chatted a little bit yesterday. Oh, really? Yeah, yep, yep, oh, yeah. Cool. We're actually talking about justifications. <laughs> really? <laughs> so very timely, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a that's awesome, man. It's yeah. uh, is he a tall guy? Because he looks like yeah. he was tall. Yeah. Yes, he is. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, I'm about six feet, so he's probably I I I I'd take him for probably six two. Yep. It looks yeah, like I'm actually. Tall. I'm six foot flat as well. And yeah, he, he was towering over me a little bit, but yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, um, I know that, uh, he said he was doing a lot of traveling. So that's, that's interesting that you guys met up. So that's yeah. over there in, yeah. in, in, in Illinois. Mm -hmm. Yep. Up in Deerfield, uh, about an hour North from the city, um, from the loop. Um, yeah. And he was, he actually gave a talk at, at the theology conference as well. Um, with figures like Van Hooser and Fred Sanders, and so wow, we'll up there. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Fred Sanders, um, he's the he he's uh he, hasn't he done some work on the Trinity recently from a yep. Thomistic point of view? Yeah, I think yeah. I have a book. Um, I have a book by him. I think he just uh oh yeah uh he edited it. It's called. Uh, the third person of the Trinity. Yep. Yep. Um, and I think yeah. he's got a forthcoming book on the Holy spirit. Um, yeah. so yeah, I, I, I think he does fantastic work in, uh, mm -hmm. in the, uh, from a Thomistic, he tries to recapture of, as much of, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas as he possibly can. Yeah. Um, and, and I believe he's a free church person <laughs> doing, is he it's really, it's really interesting. Yeah. It's interesting seeing a free church sort of non, Non-denominational, quote unquote. I don't think such a thing exists, but um, <laughs> sort of a, a non-denominational Protestant reclaiming Aquinas. It's, it's really interesting to see. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, there are people who are trying to do it. Um, I mean, every, even when I was a Reformed Baptist, um, you know, we were kind of we were really strange. If you came to our church, you were going to hear a sermon that was kind of like a Wesleyan revival sermon, something yep. you'd hear from like Leonard Ravenhill or Richard Owen Roberts. Um, I'm talking like the old school A.W. Tozer type yep. of just talking about holiness and, 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 and genuine prayer where nobody's watching you for hours. And <laughs> I'm yep. just thinking all those those yeah. uh, fiery sermons by Ravenhill that I used to listen to. One of the newer guys that picked up on that legacy, especially from the Baptistic um, uh, Mueller background, is uh, Paul Washer. He came yep. up. He came up around in the like the 2004, 2005, mm -hmm. and um, he was he he reminded me just uh, just like Leonard Ravenhill. Um, and uh, but when even so, you would come to my when I was a Baptist, you would come to my church and you would listen to that. But afterwards, during coffee break, we would, if you were new, we would walk you to the bookstore in the church. And the bookstore was all Puritan paperbacks. Wow. Yep. <laughs> um, with They're all Covenanters, Episcopalians, or, or Congregationalists of the 16th, 17th century. Yep. Um, high sacramentology so we obviously had to like footnote our recommendations um, yeah yeah i mean it, it is very interesting that the puritans had 
a higher view of baptism than most Baptists are willing to concede. Oh, yeah. Um, and that, they had a higher view of the spiritual presence of Christ in the Eucharist than most Baptists are willing to concede. Now, someone like Gavin Ortland is sort of unique. He's bringing back the London Baptist confession of, of thought, um, that stream that emerges from the London Baptist confession, yes. which was more sacramental. Yeah. Um, but that's rare today. And it's, it, is. It, it is really interesting to see this, this, um, what I see as sort of a, a resourcement of reformed theology that leads to higher sacramental views. Yeah. So that's interesting. Um, lo- there's a lot to say about that, but our topic today mm-hmm. is on justification yeah. and we already had a, a one round where we went, we, we talked about this issue. Um, I want to say was like six months ago. Mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, so. yep. got really good reviews. Yeah. Um, nobody said anything bad. I mean, yeah. uh, both Protestant and Catholic reviewers were, um, they, they both enjoyed it. Um, so here we are again. And I thought um, a good way to pick up where we left off um, is to read from a, a manual on Catholic theology um, that's quite famous. It's it's it was re, republished recently by um, a Catholic publisher, but um, I'm going to pull it up on my screen here shortly. I'm just going to look for it, but um, it really does uh, wonders to tie in this theme about. Um, Christ meriting salvation for us and us being us having that imputed to us the status that Christ achieved for the listeners who are not uh, who are who may not be aware we're talking about the the the, the gift of justification um, from a Protestant and Catholic point of view this is going to be a little bit further than introductory because we've already mm-hmm. had and uh, almost two hours of talking about that here we're going to be you know probably getting real technical right away and we're talking about the justified status of uh, how that is given to a believer and how that relates to being incorporated into the mystical body of christ who won for himself and for his body members the gift of life and how th- um, something that Sean does that's really good is that he differentiates what became popular uh, in the idea of imputation being the collection of all of Jesus's good works throughout his life being imputed to us versus the idea that the status that he has as the beloved son who was exalted to the right hand of God, winning eternal life and etern- everlasting uh, dominion, when you become a member of Christ's body, that status redounds to you without you having done any work. Christ did all the work. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I would have heard that when I was a Protestant, um, I would have been, uh, my jaw would have dropped. But at the same time, it's not contradicting anything from the Protestant um, right. schema. Yeah. Uh, so this, this, this manual on Catholic theology picks up on this i just want to read a page because i think if you follow along and the listeners follow along we can easily get right into this issue about the 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 body of christ and justification so let me see if i can share my screen while i'm looking while i'm figuring that out because i'm still not an expert if you have anything to say uh, in response to what i've said go ahead yeah, and what I can do right now is just lay out, and Eric, feel free to correct me as I lay out both perspectives. Um, so the perspective that I take um, will be the perspective that upon being united to Christ by faith, we share in the status that's pronounced over Jesus at the resurrection. Um, Jordan Cooper actually has a, a pretty good podcast on this and a pretty good YouTube video on sort of objective justification. Uh, the sort of Regensburg, and this is in the 16th century, the Regensburg Colloquy was where uh, a few Protestant theologians, famous ones, Martin Butzer uh, was among them, uh, came together with Roman Catholic theologians. And they actually came to a joint statement on justification that did end up falling apart. Luther thought it made too many concessions, and then uh, Rome thought it made too many concessions in, in both directions. Uh, but the 
idea of that doctrine of justification it would be the one that I hold. So this is sort of coming from Martin Butzer, uh, where by faith, when we're united to Christ and made one with him, we share the status that's pronounced at Jesus in the resurrection. So Second Timothy, I believe, um, it's either for sure Second Timothy, talk about Jesus being justified in the spirit. So he's, and it uses that term, it often gets translated vindicated, but it's literally that Jesus was justified. And in Romans 4, Paul talks about Jesus being raised for our justification. So what we want to say as Protestants is that when we're united to Christ, uh, we share that status that was pronounced over Jesus at the resurrection on account of Jesus's life of obedience. This differs from saying that the obedience itself is what's imputed to us. Uh, but rather his life of perfect obedience means he maintains and uh, merits even a status that's bestowed on him, namely the status of heir. And all of those who are one with him share that status with Christ. Now, uh, Eric, as I understand the Roman Catholic perspective, and again, feel free to correct me, um, and I'll do some sketching of the differences just as an overview so that'll allow us to get into the weeds. Um Eric's and, and the Roman Catholic position is that uh, in justification, uh, yes, sins are remitted, but when you're baptized, uh, which is the sacrament of faith, you are infused with the righteousness of Christ. You are joined to Christ. You're made one with him. And through the merits of Christ, which Roman Catholics will agree, will, uh, will accord with Christ's perfect life of obedience, through his merits— Christ wins for us the infusion of righteousness into our hearts. And on that basis, God accepts us as heirs. So to share the merits of Christ on the Roman Catholic perspective will have a conceptual kind of difference with, uh, from the Protestant perspective. In the Roman Catholic perspective, to share the merits of Christ in time and space means that you're infused with the righteousness of Christ. For Protestants, while you are infused with the righteousness of Christ, your Christ dwells in you. That's not what uh, what counts you righteous. It's not what puts you in the right before God. It's the sharing itself of Christ's status that puts you in the right before God. And then we'll we'll get in sort of the the weeds of how this plays into the temporal eternal uh, eternal debt of punishment distinction and how that functions in this sort of discussion. But yeah, what what do you what do you think of that phrasing? Uh, that yeah. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's a good summary, you know, um, we don't want to make this too complicated, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many people that want to make things too nuanced, okay? Yeah. yeah, that's the basic Catholic message is, is yeah. exactly how you said it. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, and uh, by the way, before I do that, um, you had mentioned Boussier. Uh, for yeah. the listeners who would like to read or find a document or a published, uh, you know, book or an article or some uh, online blog post, do you have anything that you could recommend for people who want to do a little bit of digging on the re on the historical uh, point that you uh, brought up there? Yes. So Anthony Lane has a book on justification um, on Regensburg. If you just type up like Anthony Lane Regensburg, the book will be the first thing that pops up. Um, and chapter five will be the place to go. Um, and in chapter five, uh, Anthony Lane's really like analyzing the understanding of justification that's put forth at Regensburg. So I, I would pick up his book. Okay. All right. So take note of that, everyone who's listening. Um, it's so important to uh, do a lot of reading. Expand your reading. Um, one of the problems that we have today in the dialogue between Catholics and, and Protestants is um, a severe lack of knowledge of each other's perspective. I thank God that is not the issue here with Sean, um, but I can tell you, being online, um, having spent years going door to door, witnessing and uh, talking with people online, getting questions in the private messenger on Facebook, um, there's a lot of misunderstanding on both sides and, and especially Catholics misunderstanding the, uh, Protestant side. So please look up Anthony Lane. Um, I've, you know, I, I, he's, he does a swell job of getting into the specifics on this. I know that for a fact. So, all right, 
so I'm going to pull up here on my screen. If you uh, tell me if you can see it, I'll try to zoom in a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'll try to zoom in as much as I can. Let's see if I can do do one of these things. Okay. All right. So I want to start there at the paragraph where it says in the mystery of redemption. And uh, if anybody wants to get this book that I have on the screen, um, look up. Uh, it's called The Teaching of the Catholic Church. It's two volumes. It's edited by George Smith. came out in the 1800s. Um, it was recently republished. And I'll have to find out. Let me look on Amazon real quick here. The Teaching of the Catholic Church. Church George Smith. Um, Barbados, a friend of mine, republished this with his um, with his publishing. And man, okay, here it is. All right, so this is going to be a Aruka Press, A R O U C A, Aruka Press. Um, you could pick this up, The Teaching of the Catholic Church. And uh, yes, if you want, just go to archive and you can also look it up. You could read it for free there too. Um, so I'm looking at volume two, page 673. Um, and I'll just start reading here and and uh, hopefully we can follow along um, and, and just take notes of what's being said here because I think it's going to create a good common ground from which to... to to get further into the specifics of what we've what we've been talking about. All right. In the mystery of the redemption by the word incarnate, we see the re we see the relation of fallen man to God changed to man's advantage. He has been redeemed, saved, reconciled, delivered, justified, regenerated, he has become a new creature. The significance of the redemption from the point of view of our subject lies in this, that the redemption of man is analogous to his fall. All men deriving their human nature from Adam had inherited from him the stain of original sin. And thus the whole human race in one man had been set at enmity with God. Just as man's fall had been cor corporate, so his reconciliation was to be corporate too. For the fatal solidarity with Adam, which had resulted in death and sin, was to be substituted a new and salutary solidarity, whereby all men born in sin of the first Adam might be regenerated to the life of grace in the new Adam, Jesus Christ. Our lost rights to supernatural development in this world and to a vision of God after the time of probation have been restored to us through the supernatural action of Christ's human nature, hypostatically united to the word of God. Christ is the spokesman of mankind, the representative man, the second Adam, carrying out for our sake what we could not carry out for ourselves giving to God that glory and adoration, that worship, thanksgiving, and reparation, which the man God alone could give. In virtue of our solidarity with him, and this is where it gets very, gets very, we need to pay attention. In virtue of our solidarity with him, we share in the results of his activity, and our share will be the greater in the measure in which we more and more completely identify, identify ourselves with Christ, put on Christ, become other Christs. It is in terms of this solidarity of man with Christ, in terms of the mystical body formed by mankind, united with its head, that St. Thomas, as follows, sets forth the doctrine of redemption and the application of its first fruits. Now he's going to cite St. Thomas Aquinas here. Quote, Since he is our head, then, by the passion which he endured from love and obedience, he delivered us, his members, from our sins, as by the price of his passion. In the same way as if a man, by the good industry of his hands, 
were to redeem himself from a sin committed with his feet. For just as the natural body is one, though made up of diverse members, so the whole church, Christ's mystical body, is reckoned as one person with its head, which is Christ. Notice the word reckoned there. Um, continuing, quote, Grace was in Christ not merely as an individual, but also as in the head of the whole church, to whom all are united as members to a head, who constitute one mystical person. And hence, it is that Christ's merits extends to others inasmuch as they are his members. Even as in a man, the action of the head reaches in a manner to all his members, since it perceives not merely for itself alone, but for all the members. Another quote, quote, the sin of an individual harm harms himself alone, but the sin of Adam, who was appointed by God to be the principle of the whole nature, is transmitted to others by carnal propagation. So, too, the merit of Christ, who has been appointed by God to be the head of all men in regard to grace, extends to all his members. Um, just two more quotes here from Aquinas. Quote, as the sin of Adam reaches others only by carnal generation, so too the merit of Christ reaches others only by spiritual regeneration, which takes place in baptism, wherein we are all incorporated with Christ, according to Galatians 3, 27, as many of you as have, have been baptized in Christ, have put on Christ, and it is by grace that it is granted to man to be incorporated with Christ, and thus man's salvation is from grace. Uh, one more quote from Aquinas here. Christ's satisfaction works its effect in us inasmuch as we are incorporated with him as the members of members with their head, as stated above. Now, the members must be conformed with their head. Consequently, as Christ first had grace in his soul with bodily pa passibility and through the passion attained to the glory of immortality, so we likewise, who are his members, are freed by his passion from all debt of punishment, yet so that we first receive in our souls the spirit of adoption of sons, whereby our names are written down for the inheritance of immortal glory, while we yet have a passable and mortal body, but afterwards, being conformable to the sufferings and death of Christ, we are brought into the immortal glory, according to the saying of the apostle, and of sons, heirs also, heirs indeed of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Yet so if we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. Amen. <laughs> okay, yeah. let me stop sharing for a second. Yeah. Well, and that's this. So this is super important because I think it shows that there. I really think there is a potential, and I, I hope and pray for this, of something like a neo Regensburg, um, namely if the concept of uh, Christ as the totus Christus, Christ in the church as the totus Christus, namely that the church and Christ together constitute one mystical person. I think that that idea does a lot of work in terms of bringing Protestants and Roman Catholics together in spaces of fruitful dialogue. Uh, because interestingly, what what you just read from Aquinas, and you know, I, this paper is still under review that I mentioned way back, way back the, a few yeah, months yeah. ago. Yeah. Um, but um, I trace the fact that the Reformed, especially in John Owen and in Richard Sibbs, use that language of because we are one mystic person, we share in the title uh, to eternal life. So that's really interesting that that you see that, that kind of language used in both camps. Yes, yes. And yeah, so, and this is something that I really hope gets more treatment because when I was a Reformed uh, Baptist and then when I started travailing, more in the historical route of the Reformation. And uh, when I was an Anglican studying these things, um, I started to read these things about the, you know, the union of Christ, the mystical person, the, the, the one, the totus Christus of, mm -hmm. that Augustine talked about. Um, and I, I didn't think it was a Protestant idea. 
I, yeah. I thought it was only something that, you know, Catholics, and, and I've not really heard Orthodox speak about it, but it does come up in the Cappadocians uh, oh. a, a, a bit. Um, and then Maximus the Confessor also. Um, yep. And I mean, it really goes back to Irenaeus too. I mean, we yep. can really go, <laughs> we can go far. Um, but to, he, to hear a Protestant recapture this um, from the older Protestants is going to go a long way um, to to um, educate Catholics and people who are inquiring into the Catholic Church um, that there's more ways of explaining justification uh, than what seems to be the standard status quo today. Would you agree with yep. that? Yeah, I do. And there's a paper that uh, Anthony Lane cited in um, his book on justification that I think really helps uh, where, and I don't know who wrote it. I have it somewhere in my sources in Zotero. Um, but um, there's a paper that's come out that showed that there were actually multiple sort of framings of the idea of imputation in the 16th century. And the one that becomes the legacy of primarily the reform tradition, because interestingly, the articulation I've just given actually still survives in Lutheran circles. Uh, but uh, in reform circles, which becomes the dominant articulation of imputation, uh, this the, that understanding is actually more of an 18th, uh, 19th century development uh, of a more primal idea of being bound up to Christ as one mystic person. This is really interesting. Now, I, Eric, and I kind of want to ask you about this. I yeah. think where our differences are going to be, the more I've reflected on this, is probably not as much like we can talk about infused imputed righteousness and baptism but i think the more key differences are going to be uh temporal and eternal debt and as as that corresponds to the merit of christ and how the merit of christ interacts with the temporal and eternal debt of punishment yeah 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 so um the first thing i'd like to say is that um when just on this whole issue of imputation versus infusion, right? Um, because it would almost seem as though it's a logical corollary that yeah. it, if uh, if we are if we are uh, united with Christ and and in through regeneration, yep. uh, that we obtain His winnings or His right. the, pri the prize that He earned it, it redounds to us. Um, and this is this is something that Catholics can affirm. Yeah. Because, because Catholics at the Council of Trent, we said that the meritorious cause of justification is not in an, is not in infused love right. or infused faith. Yeah. Um, it's also not in faith in itself. Mm -hmm. um, it's in the it's in the passion, yeah. right? The passion and resurrection of Christ. Um, that and more specifically, the you know it talks about the, the blood. Of Christ, which is just another way of talking about his death. Um, so that alone can serve to win what we receive in in, sal in justification. But what justification consists of is our, it, it, you know, New Testament says washing yeah. or regeneration, and the, where where we understand these facets to line up, mm -hmm. you know is where we disagree between Protestants and Catholics. For Catholics, we believe that when you become a, a, a body member of Christ, it's not just it's not just that you're now under a, a corporate head that shares the goods with you. Mm -hmm. It's that you've become a vitally living part of that body. Mm-hmm. And so this is where the ontology comes to be constitutive with the justified gift, you know, the, the gift of justification. Yeah. So this is what's going to lend right into the issue of temporal yeah. debts and, and, and temporal punishments. Yeah. Is that um, those these are these are sufferings or not sufferings, but these are debts, right? that continue to endure even after somebody is justified. And, you know, sometimes a Protestant might say, well, this doesn't seem to make any sense because 
um, if we're already killed and risen in Christ, um, it just doesn't make any sense to put, you know, to put uh, upon us debts um, that have already been satisfied for. And uh, it's, I mean, it's a good, yeah. you know, it's a good question. You yeah. know, uh, did you want to say something? Uh, did you want to say something in response yeah. to that so far? Yep. Yeah. That, yeah. That's great. Yeah. And I think so. And, and that's really helpful to point out that the disagreement is not over uh, whether uh, in just in um, at least can the justified person ever be ontologically, you know, somehow distant from Christ. Both of us are going to say no, um, because the um, there is. And so that's why I was like I was reflecting quite a bit on, OK, how do we parse the difference here? Uh, because both of us want to say that there's an ontological thing that happens to us through which we're justified because union with Christ is viscerally ontological. It happens through the, the action of the Holy Spirit who binds us to Jesus. But uh, if so, on, if on my perspective, justification is identifying an aspect of union, namely it's identifying this aspect of sharing in the title of Christ and God's recognition of the person as having an, a title to eternal life on the basis of sharing that title with Christ. As I see things, the differences then are going to come out in as we're thinking about um, what sin does and how merit covers sin. So if you're okay, Eric, I kind of wanted to get a little bit into the weeds. I actually have sure. a, like just a few selections from the Council of Trent that I think might help. Yeah. Um, so let's see. I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. Uh, it should be okay. See that okay? Let me see. Let me add it to the stream. Can you see it on the stream? I could see it. Okay, great. Okay, so um, I, I embolden the parts that are relevant. So session six of the Council of Trent, that's where um, the definition of justification is um, given. Now, I highlighted this aspect of confidence, and I, I want to eventually show how this ties in in a second. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things the reformers were saying was that we can know actually with certainty that you're justified, that you're absolved from sin, that you, you are righteous. And now while the Roman Catholic position often gets straw man, you know, it's not the case that Roman Catholics are uh, saying that you have to live in perpetual doubt and, and absolute agnosticism about your own state. That's not true. They, but uh, Bellarmine highlights sort of three categories of certainty that pertains to this question. Um, the certainty of faith is certainty about the contents of revelation, I believe. Um, and there's a tier of certainty uh, that's one below that. He has three when he talks about this. Uh, there's one below that, which is sort of the certainty of testimony, which is broad testimony of uh, of a human individual, of uh, community that gives us access to historical knowledge. And then below that, he says, there's a kind of competence, like the certitude of competence is what it's called, that you could have about your salvation, uh, which is a competence that you're in a state of grace. But I want to highlight a key part of, okay, well, where where does uh, this, where does the lack of confidence, where does the sort of rebuttal to the Protestant claim come from? Um, and it comes, in my estimation, in this sentence of chapter 9. For as no pious person ought to doubt the mercy of God, the merit of Christ, and the virtue and efficacy of the sacraments, so each one, and the emboldened part here, when he considers himself and his own weakness and indisposition, may have fear and apprehension concerning his own grace, since no one can know with the certainty of faith, which cannot be subject to error, that he has obtained the grace of God. Okay. So what, as I read that, and it looks like what's being said there, is that when I consider my own sin, that gives me, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, I look at my own sin and then you have to just despair. That's that's not what's being said. But what is being said is that when you look at your own sin, that at least gives you a reason for fear and apprehension uh, that, that bars you from having sort of the certainty of faith that you're in Christ, that you have obtained the grace of God. Okay, so in Canon 10 of this session, what's... One of the key Protestant claims 
is that uh, this this phrase, the justice of Christ, it, you can think of it as sort of the righteousness of Christ. It's just justice is righteousness in Latin. Sure. Um, so if anyone says that men are just without the justice of Christ, whereby he merited for us to be justified, or that it is by that justice itself that they are formally just, let them be anathema. So this is sort of the idea that it's actually by the, the rightness of Christ itself that we are formally just. Uh, now, there are ways you can parse that, and certainly the theologians in the in the wake of the Regensburg colloquy um, wanted to actually affirm a dual place for imputation, interestingly, as well. Uh, but it does seem like this at least is pressing against uh, certain understandings of imputation. Um, and then Canon 11, and if, if anyone says that men are justified either by the sole imputation of Christ's justice or by the sole remission of sins to the exclusion of the grace and charity which is poured forth in their hearts by the Holy Spirit and is inherent in them, uh, or even that the grace whereby we are justified is only the, the favor of God, let it be anathema. Again, there are ways to parse that. So, for example, Protestants believe that faith has to have a principle which affects love for it to be justifying faith. So there are ways to parse that that might bring unity. But also, again, this does seem to press against uh, the Protestant sort of understanding of things. Okay, and then one more thing, and then Eric, sure. you can uh, give your thoughts Take here. Your time. So in session 14, we get to this notion of satisfaction. And this gives us sort of a handle on what the debates of the Reformation were about, right? So on the this is chapter uh, eight of session 14, on the necessity and fruit of satisfaction. Uh, and I'm just going to read this section. So finally, as regards satisfaction, so satisfaction here is referring to, if, if you remember what penance consists in, I'm, I'm sure most of your viewers know what penance consists mm -hmm. in, um, but uh, it involves contrition over sin, uh, a intent at least, or a desire, a firm intention to confess and to receive absolution. Now, Trent did make pardon it, or uh, provision for, it's, it's not the case that if you desire to confess your sin and you die on the way, you're going to hell. That, that's Trent teaches against that. Um, but there's a desire to confess your sin and then to receive absolution. And satisfaction then isn't, it doesn't correspond to the eternal debt of punishment. When you commit a mortal sin, you fall out of a state of grace, and you confess your sin, you receive absolution, that clears by itself before you, you do any works. Uh, that clears the eternal debt of punishment. It puts mm -hmm. you back into a state of grace, mm -hmm. which means you're back into God's favor. Now, that said, the priest will also assign works of satisfaction. And here we get into the, the uh, exposition of what those works are for. So finally, as regards satisfaction, which as it is of all parts of penance, that which has been at all times recommended to the Christian people by our fathers, so it is the one especially which in our age, under the loftiest pretext of piety, impugned by those who have an appearance of godliness, but have denied the power thereof. The Holy Synod declares that it is wholly false and alien from the word of God, that guilt is never forgiven by the Lord without the whole punishment also being there with pardon. So this was a key claim of both the Lutheran and Reformed uh, reformers, that when uh, we are forgiven by God, all guilt is cleared. And, and that pertains to sort of this punitive element that falls on us on, in a, on account of our sin. Um, and then I'll uh, skip down to that next emboldened part. And truly, the nature of divine justice seems to demand that they who through ignorance have sinned before baptism be received into grace in one manner, and in another those who, after having been freed from the servitude of sin and of the devil, and after having received the gift of the Holy Spirit, have not feared knowingly to violate the temple of God and to grieve the Holy Spirit. Uh, I don't know why I emboldened that part, actually. <laughs> so skipping down to this 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 uh, phrase right here. So uh, penance has a twofold function, as, a, as I understand things. And again, Eric, feel free to correct yeah. this or come back on this. Um, it has the function, yes, to serve as a remedy for sin. So when we sin, right, when we commit especially grievous sins, um, you actually find this aspect, at least, of penance even in Protestant circles, right? If someone uh, caves to pornography, they might, you know, uh, sell their laptop or bar themselves from internet uh, access or whatever. The purpose of those works is to, to um, help cultivate virtues that 
enable you to overcome sin. So that's one, one role of penance. The other role of penance, and this is really key because I don't think that works of penance uh, are purely medicinal. And this emboldened part is a clear reason why. Um, so when the priest assigns penance, let them have in view that the satisfaction which they owe for the mission of new life and a medicine of infirmity, but also for the avenging and punishment of past sins. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing there. Yes. Um, okay, oh, here, here's what's key. And penance is not, it often gets talked about in ways that are real function. And that is one function of penance, but Protestants actually agree with that function of penance. What made the notion of penance controversial and uh, something the reformers contended against was this punitive aspect of penance. So in Roman Catholic theology, uh, sin has two kinds of consequences, the eternal debt of punishment, that's hell, uh, and the mm -hmm. temporal debt of punishment. Um, and you can think of that as sort of a, uh, a finite um, element of punishment that, that must be meted out uh, in response to sin. Now, when you commit a mortal sin, um, you incur that eternal debt of punishment as merited, as mentioned, but you also incur this temporal debt of punishment, confession and absolution that gets that gets rid of the eternal debt of punishment, but you still have this temporal debt. And the way you sort of, um, you satisfy the temporal debt is by doing these works of satisfaction that the priest assigns. And yes, that that's for healing, but that's also for satisfying the debt of punishment. And so part of the role of purgatory in the medieval era was not just the purification of the believer, though that was one stated reason, but also uh, to satisfy the temporal debt of punishment through suffering. Eric, what, what would you, would you say that's a fair summary and feel free to push back on that? Yes, I, I don't need to push back on that. I think what you're saying is absolutely correct. Um, it seems to me what has happened um, in the last, you know, I don't know, 50, 60 years, you could say, um, is that a, a certain element of the patristic teaching on purgatory or on just just on penance in general um, it, it has been has pushed out the other core, you know, the other side of the coin. So in other words, you've got this medicinal uh, personal uh you know the, the 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 person mending himself to be habitually righteous through this you know painful medicine that's supposed to work on the soul and and conform us to Christ which sounds pretty and beautiful and almost undeniable because of what the you know explicit teaching of scripture but the other part uh where there's temporal debts <laughs> for the christian um, that he has to satisfy through pains, through these pains and through the process um, that he's going through, sufferings of whatever form. Uh, that is also, it's, 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 it's inextricably tied together. Yeah. Um, and, and it sounds kind of bad. So, and, and it sounds more difficult to defend. So what you have is uh, you have Catholics today who say, well, you know, that's like that's never been dogmatized or that's that that explanation has never been um, enforced in the church or something like that. We could just, you know, talk about pure personal purification, you know, and uh, that's a load of balderdash. You know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. The the historic teaching has always been. In fact, it was primarily um yeah built off of the idea that you there are temporal debts that are that have to be satisfied which means they have to be paid you know yeah uh in the forms of pains and things like that so my, my position would be that you know we we don't need like a, a robust teaching on the necessity of uh, of, of satisfying temporal debts in the New Testament, just like you wouldn't need, um, you know, a robust, explicit statement about the imputation of Christ's righteousness. This sure. is something that can be systematically deduced, yeah. and sure. and de depending on how well one can defend it, it, it will be persuasive. 
but what we could show in the New Testament is that there is a punitive element in that God brings into the life of those who are already in the covenant with him. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we know that that can't be f towards eternal death because, no. because of their outstanding status as a child of God. Yeah. And so we deduce a temporal punishment um, what, how much that temporal punishment exists in an individual, it's not really mathematically quantifiable yeah. by the yeah. church. So, you know, yeah. you had mentioned how we might commit a mortal sin and then the grace of God is, 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 is snuffed out of us. Uh, but then when we come back in confession, we have the eternal debt remitted, but then there's that, um, that temporal debt. Uh, the eternal debt being forgiven through the blood of Christ, and then the 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 temporal debts that remain. Well, some of those temporal debts may have gone already, um, sure. just yeah. just by the person's repentance, by yep. uh, the certain outward actions that vivify this, like you know, um, tears of repentance. You know, yeah. like Saint Paul describes in Second Corinthians seven, um, that the repentance that leads to life. And the repentance that leads to death, um, the repentance that leads to life is always associated with this eagerness and this yearning and this uh, wanting to um, wanting to overcome all of the 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 ugliness of sin that they were involved in. Uh, and in the Old Testament, that took the form of uh, even by way of program, um, yeah. putting on sackcloth and ashes. Um, you know, putting, you know, putting dirt on, you know, to, to, to identify themselves with, you know, basically dirt and death and where they're coming from. They're just but dust before God. Um, these are all things that, you know, as a, when I was a Protestant, I would view, I would have viewed as those are not functionally satisfactory. Those are mm -hmm. just, you know, illustrative. Um, they're just byproducts. Or even uh, medicinal. <laughs> it could be just medicinal, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. But um, I think it, I think there's a case to be made that, uh, especially when we incorporate the early tradition of the church, that they're satisfactory. Great. Yeah. 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 So let's get in the, so methodologically, I completely agree that systematic theology, especially as a systematic theology guy, like yeah. definitely agree methodologically that's a valid way of doing theology otherwise i'm in trouble <laughs> you'd be out of business real quick yes yeah. <laughs> yes so so i want to i want to press into that so my understanding is that in baptism um in roman catholic theology both the uh, temporal and eternal debt of punishment is remitted uh, through the merits of christ such that if one were to die like a second after baptism they would go straight to heaven um at least presumably, you know, yeah. assuming they're, they didn't sin, yeah. um, they would go straight to heaven uh, because both, both are remitted. Now, would that be your understanding as, as I? Yes, did, that's, that that's true. Okay. That, that's true. Yep, that's true. Great. So then here would be one, one critique from the Protestant perspective, because um, we're going to look at those passages like First Corinthians 3, uh, which speaks of, the um, the fire of judgment testing believers works or uh, Luke I forget where but the the master returning and beating the servant giving this sure. one of the a light we're gonna say okay like either the punishments are medicinal or at the end we give an account um, and giving an account is painful <laughs> sure. um, that, that is you know that's hard to do to come to confront our sin um, but one of my critiques of of um, this notion is that if baptism remits the temporal debt of punishment, then it doesn't seem in principle that penance couldn't. Right now, even even if penance is assigned to like function in this medicinal way uh, to cultivate virtue in the soul, which I think is completely fair. That's valid. There's a historic precedent for that, scriptural precedent for that. Um, but in terms of the remitting of temporal debt. It would seem that if baptism remits temporal debt, there's nothing in principle that stops God from remitting the temporal debt of punishment upon uh, confession, absolution. Would that what 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 would you yeah how how would you think about that? 
Yeah, so, I mean, the only thing that would stop it is, you know, his design and plan. Yeah. But, but, yeah. This, but yeah. if if we, if we're going to say, you know, could it be otherwise? Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay, great. So then when I think about that, if it's the case that God could remit the temporal debt of punishment through a sacrament because he does in baptism, then it would seem that um, there actually isn't a reason at least that we can see, other than his choice, his free decision to, to uh, impose the temporal debt of punishment. Uh, but beyond sort of the divine, his divine counsel, it would seem that we can't discern a reason on this side of, of revelation for there being a temporal debt of punishment, um, especially if penance could still play, which it does, I would argue, in Protestant traditions um, play a medicinal role. Um, it would seem that God just chooses uh, to impose the temporal debt of punishment, and we really can't see a reason why he would do that. So, yeah. Okay. So, what I what I would say to that is 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 that having a debt to pay for is is a medicine to receive. So, mm -hmm. in other words, um, for example, you know, I can if if somebody if like if I have a a, a, a some sort of problem with my hand like gangrene or something um there's going to be a pain to amputate my hand to save the rest of the body um that's you know that sounds like a you know here's a, a medical problem and the only way to deal with that medical problem is to go through this pain to, mm -hmm. to make you well um but i think that part of being medically well is also accepting responsibilities to their conclusions. And so having to pay for breaking my neighbor's window or um, stealing extra funds out of the inheritance, you know, that our father, like if my, you know, if my father passed away and I was only given a certain amount and I took more than I should have somehow, you know, I hired mm -hmm. a hacker of some sort. Right. Um, part of the cleansing of my repentance is the restitutive and repairing part of making it up. So in other words, I can't just come back to the scene and say, hey, guys, you guys caught me red handed. But here's the really good news. In the interim, um, yeah. I've been helping out this charity. I've been doing right. this with yeah. my family. Um, I have paid this much to these pro-life ministries. And guess what? Um, I've been tuned up, uh, sure. morally speaking. Um, well, they're going to say, yeah, but you stole money from us. You still sure. have a responsibility. So I would say the moment I say yes and then initiate the process to start paying that debt, I am simultaneously entering into another medical phase another uh another um what's it called uh when it's a, it's a therapy it's a therapeutic phase sure. where where i'm accepting the debt and then paying for it sure and, and, and so uh, so anyway that's i think you get what i'm trying to say yeah that's helpful so yeah let's let's talk about that so why wouldn't that be covered so cuz i would agree that if someone if i broke someone else's car I can't just say, you know what, I'm sorry. Like I also sh should make restitution. And there's a principle for that in the, um, in the Torah um, and in the Pentateuch, especially there's, there's, there's restitution. You add extra, you don't just make up for it, but you also add extra. Uh, yeah. But that said, now restitution seems to be slightly different conceptually than uh, suffering as punishment. So for example, um, Anselm talks about how we we suffer, um, we offer up our sufferings as punishment when we can't pay otherwise. Yes. So people, for example, went to debtor's prison when they couldn't pay their debt. Yes. Uh, now, if we can, however, like uh, through suffering, for, so for example, Protestants believe that the final judgment will give an account uh, and that will involve, that will be painful, um, that there's going to be weeping even on the part, part of the elect. Uh, but, uh, so if that element of restitutional healing can be accomplished through the act of restitution, 
what then would be how would accepting the debt of punishment, which seems to be um, something that's satisfied in in light of the failure to uh, make restitution, how, how would that be medicinal? Yeah. So like at the Council of Florence, um, you know, when it defined purgatory, mm-hmm. it spoke about how when pains of repentance, pains of restitution and satisfaction have not been performed Mm -hmm. when they have not been adequately performed um then you have this what's left like would you like you appeal to saint enzo right right the only thing that's left is is uh involuntary uh, suffering yep um and so that's why that's there it's because if if i did not attend to my responsibilities then my inattentiveness to them, which would have also been an opportunity for me to enter into that therapeutic phase, yeah, will w- doesn't just sizzle out sure. because of the blood of Christ. Um, it stays there as a way for me to overcome whatever it was that made me re- refuse sure. to do that. Now, somebody might say, well, you just forgot about it. You know, you you didn't just willfully refuse. You just forgot about it, right? Well, maybe God, if that's the case, maybe God makes those adjustments, you know? Maybe he makes those adjustments, you know? But um, if I have to go through a time where, you know, let's say some archangels or angels deliver to me and say, Eric, um, before we carry you off to the gates of heaven, no. Um, there are some things that you did not overcome through yeah. your works of penance and pains of satisfactions, yeah. um, or, or rather restitutive satisfactions. Yeah. Um, now there's involuntary suffering that you will have to go through. I don't think that this is somehow, um, incommensurate or non-commensurate with a therapeutic medical self-healing phase. I think that they're simultaneous because once I recognize that now I have involuntary sufferings to go through, there is that much more of a quantity of thinking about what I did, why I left it alone and didn't take care of it. Um, Probably, uh, you know, Whatever that pain is, um, that's not to be somehow disassociated with yeah. uh, with the per- you know. In other words, somebody might come along and say, "Well, what if what if somebody dies as a Catholic in mm-hmm. Catholic theology, and they are just absolutely perfect when they die? Like all the gears and nuts and bolts in them, morally speaking, were like perfected like Jesus, and then when they died." Some math, some angelic mathematician comes out with this computer and says, "Well, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, this ontological perfection has nothing to do with the uh, uh, calculation of debt. You still have, you know, yeah, <laughs> uh, ten yeah. years of this." I don't think that can exist. Right. Yeah. Which I think I think that would be consistent. But then let's let's try to. So in my mind, okay, let's let's just grant that then. Let's say in baptism, because baptism does remit the temporal debt of punishment, right? So someone is a porn addict or they're, um, they've murdered someone, right? And they get baptized. Now, it would seem that then if it were the case that uh, the, the temporal debt of punishment being satisfied through sufferings uh, has this medicinal effect, then it wouldn't really fit with the, the idea that baptism remits temporal debt. Let's say someone it comes fresh out of a, an addiction, they get baptized. So temporal debts remitted and then they die like a set, like the next day. Right. Right. Um, that it seems then that the temporal debt of punishment wasn't necessary in that case, uh, for their healing, even though they had lived this addiction and might still even have these proclivities and habits from their addiction. Uh, and yet it would be the case, you know, through penance, so how do those two pieces fit together? So, yeah. so if, mm-hmm. if if the the I guess the question is like if temporal debt is necessary in the case of penance, why is it unnecessary right after baptism? 
Yeah. So, and that's, it comes back to the nature of that initial justification. Mm. You know, I just, we just had this Bible study in our, in our living room the other night where, you know, I was taking the kids through salvation history and, you know, we went through the, the story of Israel, Israel's failure, um, you know, the curses of the covenants, the, bl the blessing of the covenant, um, Israel's history plummeting into sin, idolatry and greed and everything else. Um, the curses of the covenant come crashing down through Gentile oc occupation and the, the temples destroyed all these things. Prophets come, call them to repentance. And I said, I asked them, I said, um, what is just a prophet coming and saying, repent, 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 um, going to work? And uh, one of my sons said, no, it's just going to repeat the process. And I said, mm -hmm. okay, so you, you, you're understanding now one of the reasons why God did all this. You know, mm -hmm. the reason why he let history go this way was to show that there needed to be a new model of a human being created. Yeah. Right. Yep. And um, so when you're, when you're initially baptized, that's what's happening. You're literally going from an, from one human. You're you're going from from one human constitution to another, mm. and so you're 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 a new creation in Christ. So in order to keep the integrity of that transition, it's got to be that when you're baptized, you're clean as a whistle. You know, um, it has to be. But you know, once you enter into the covenant. Once you're baptized, once you're washed, there is a heightened sense of responsibility upon that person than a person who was like a Corinthian, you know, in the in the orgies in the temples for 20, 30 years. Yeah. And they've got all these, pro, pro, you know, these uh, problems with them it, when they get it, it's kind of like what's going to happen at the end of time, you know, with the blinking of an eye, like Paul says. There's going to be a change, right? Yeah. Well, wait a minute. What about the angelic mathematicians? They got all this time left calculated for all these people. Um, no, God's yeah. God's gonna make it boom. He's gonna yeah. all that sat all that all that um, satisfaction that's needed. Somehow yeah. it's gonna come down. How? I don't know. Does it make a lot of sense? Not really, because it would seem as though there's a quant there's a there's such a mismatch here. Somebody sure. who has to suffer, somebody who has to suffer purgatorial, involuntary purgatorial suffering for whatever length of time. Yeah. And then some 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 Christian who lives at the end of time who deserves to pay this, you know, the same or more as people who lived in the intermediate phase. And they're going to be just instantly in the clouds. What the heck, you know? And I think that yeah. I, I, I think that this, it, it's just really going to come back to the parable of the uh, what's it, the the hired servants, you know, where it's mm -hmm. like, how did how did one get more? How did the people who worked more got the same than the people who worked less? It, it's all because it's founded on grace. It's all yes. founded on grace. So why God allows a certain you know, a differentiation in how t temporal punishment is paid for. Um, I, I, I think it's still medicinal. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's to be disassociated from that. Sure. Um, like I said before, but at the same time, for some people, like at the moment of baptism or at the very last moment of human history, something, it, it, it happens instantaneously. Sure. Sure. And I don't know how, yeah. I don't know how, yeah. But, yeah. Would, so, yeah, so that's helpful. So would you want to say it seems like the reason temporal debt uh, accrues, um, you know, after like after baptism, uh, one commits mortal sin, the temporal debt accrues because they're in the covenant. And that's a more serious uh, violation of God's law than prior to being in the covenant. Is that is that yeah that's one thing that's one way okay. to look at it that's one way to look at it i mean god is going to be the god you know the heavenly courts and the heavenly file cabinets are not something that will know everything in perfect mathematical certainty for but you, you might have somebody who was never baptized yeah but they've been studying christian theology for 
20, 30 years, right. you know? Yeah. And so they've known the law, they've known yeah. the gospel, they've known all these things. Um, and so let's, let's, let's kind of let, in order, in order, in order let's steal man your position. You've got yeah. this guy who's just like fully aware of yeah. what those things are. And the response I would have to that is the fact that he was always inactive to yeah. respond to the gospel um, means he was blind. Yes. And I you would know, agree with that. There was yeah. a, there's a, there, yeah. Now, there is a, I, I don't want to say that um, because the New Testament does talk about a judicial blinding, meaning yes. a blinding that somebody deserves, yep. right? Yep. Um, but if there was a transition into conversion, I do think that even a judicially blinded person um, has uh, mitigations to guilt um, sure. versus somebody who has the, their eyes open they receive they've tasted the yeah. heavenly gift right yeah. um some th that has a heightened sense yeah. of high-handedness if i fail to attend to the call yeah you know? yeah so that's really helpful so from what i would say then i think the protestant response to that would be to say i to concede that yes it, it is a more so hebrews 10 um, it's it's more serious to trample upon the blood of Christ by which we were sanctified and set apart. That's that's a serious thing. Um, it's serious to have the light and reject it. Yeah. Um, so there, I would say that's true. That is a more serious sin. I think where we push back is to say, and yet with ironically, I think with a phrase that you would agree with that the merits of Christ are so utterly infinitely sufficient to cover even that. Um, and so, you know, for us, and this is sort of the broader, and I think this is actually kind of a unifying theme in, amongst Anglicans, Lutherans, and the Reformed and Methodists as well, um, is that what we think happens in the Eucharist and what we think happens in repentance is not a second plank of, in the sense of, um, you can make the second plank language work, but in the right. sense of it's uh, a more difficult baptism, but we think it's actually a restoration of of baptismal grace. So if someone, the, the, what should give someone doubt is if they're, let's say, uh, they're sinning and they're like, you know what? I just don't care. I just want to sin a little bit more. Right. Then that's, that's where we'd say you're playing with fire. And if they persist in that, then that means they'll get cut off at some point by God judicially. Um, I, I wouldn't know when necessarily, except I would keep calling them back to repentance by the time they're persisting in sin and it's fitting to excommunicate then at that time, that's sort of a, a, an ecclesial recognition that this person has severed themselves from grace. Um, but that said, upon repentance, uh, God actually, we would say, restores baptismal grace in the person um, and refreshes baptismal grace. And then the Eucharist continues to communicate baptismal grace uh, so that that empowers person. So long as they receive that with faith, which includes then the intention to, to make amends for their life. Yeah. Um, but that would be true even in baptism. You know, so if someone was baptized, um, ideally their faith actually, and we would say essentially their faith, if it's a living faith, will include the intention to make amends for the ways they've defrauded people, uh, like the tax collector, right? Like right. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Um, Zacchaeus. But with, and so we would say that actually happens in repentance too. What what would be now that that view seems to me so then the response then to the claim that sin is more serious on this side in the covenant we'd say yes and the blood of Christ is deeper still um, that Christ's merits are actually even sufficient to cover that should someone repent and and come before the Lord in in humility so what yeah. what would be the sort of response to that yeah so you know in principle God could just never t take the punitive aspect out completely um but he for some reason in his own in his own wisdom he has allowed both reward mm -hmm. you know and injurious pain you know injurious effects sure. um to accrue to the baptized mm -hmm. um so the baptismally innocent you know um, baptismal innocence is not going to be uh, the only thing that we show up with on the day of judgment, you know, yeah. if, if even for the elect, right? Sure. They yep. are, they're going to be rewarded for all that they've done. Yeah, Romans 2. 
Romans yeah. 2, Paul talks about the, the yeah. crown of righteousness that he is going to be rewarded with. Yep. Um, it's good. We're on the same page with that. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the corollary to that would be there is in, injuries, spiritual sure. injuries. And this kind of gets into that issue of, you know, um, you know, the the early church liturgies talk about prayers for the dead. And this is I know we're getting we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but no, I'm, I'm trying to make a point. I'm, I'm trying to make yeah. a point here to what we're talking about here. Yeah. Um, the early church liturgies that pray for the dead, um, mm -hmm. some of them, the syntax, uh, the terms used um, so almost give across this idea that they're they're just getting purified yeah mm -hmm. they're just getting their soul is kind of like suiting up for yeah. heavenly worship right yeah. um but i would say eight out of ten right sure. so that's that's what four out of five four out four fifths of them um you've get this language of mm -hmm. um, punitive sure. satisfaction sure. you know sure. and and yeah, here an yeah, echo. Yeah. I don't know if that's on me. Let me make sure my phone is not with me. That's on. Okay, it's gone. It's it's gone cool. now. Um, uh, so it it seems to me that the punitive element and the and the uh, ontological glorification element, you know, or the ontological repairing element, let's call yeah. it. Sure. Um, those two things in God. Are obviously not conceptually identical. Sure. Yep. But but they're indissoluble. Sure. Sure. And yeah. and and so I I do I do want to recognize the apparent mismatch or the apparent I, I think absurdity is too strong of a word of somebody who's you know got it's lived a life of sin um, and then boom all their all their debt is gone. They die, and they immediately go into heaven. Um, whereas, you know, Christians who've been missionaries and we've been fighting the good fight and all these things, and and we don't get to do that when we die. It looks as kind of it does look it does kind of look like there's some problematic uh, inequality there. Sure. Yep. So I, I do want to. Mm -hmm completely sympathize with that and I, I i understand that that's how it seems yeah. um but i i do think that there are more than one things about the gospel and about divine revelation sure. that could scratch our head and i think this sure. is just i think this is just one of them but i yeah. think we could ask the lord for help sure. to understand this and I, I think that there have been men who've been able to explain the reasonableness of this even though it's not apparently reasonable sure yeah, so that's really helpful, and that, that's super honest. Um, I, I, I think, so there's sort of two thoughts to mind, because I do think the reward passages are really important to address. And Calvin in the Institutes, he addresses them. So how do we think about this? Well, the Reformed perspective, not surprisingly, has written a lot more on this than the Lutheran perspective, because Lutherans have sort of been very hesitant to talk about the role of works in final salvation. The Reformed have not. Um, we've been more okay with talking about that. So in our perspective, um, the way, you know, so even John Owen actually talks about, and Calvin does in, I believe, book two of the Institutes, um, he talks about works as sort of the way and means by which we come into possession of salvation. So that's really, that's really interesting language. And then Edwards, of course, talks about holiness as the way to salvation. So what do they mean by that? You know, okay, so... For them, they argued that uh, just, salvation is more than justification. It includes justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justified by faith alone, true enough. But we're being saved, which means sanctification, and that's a form of salvation. Right? And then final salvation is when sort of that wells up into, like, into that final state. And so in the Reformed perspective, um, works are the way and means of salvation in the sense that as I live into a life of holiness that produces Christ in me, that forms Christ in me. And so the quality then of life I have at the at, in the eschaton is sort of organically grows out of the practice of holiness uh, in this life and in the next, but in this life. So Edwards talks about 
in I believe Heaven is a World of Love, he talks about some people having bigger cups uh, with which to drink of God and those cups being prepared by the life of holiness. And so they would want to say eternal life is, because Galatians 6 uses that language, it's reaped from the Spirit as even a reward, we can talk about it as a reward, but it's an organic reward. It sort of organically grows out of the practice of holiness right now, such that at the end, uh, we come to the Lord uh, shaped by our holiness, in, in, and that allows us varying degrees of participation in him, various cups uh, cups by which to drink, uh, as Edwards puts it. So that would be one way of sort of, th that's sort of the Reformed reading of those passages. And then alternatively, um, you know, the, the flip side to that then, because in 1 Corinthians 3, there's a flip side, would be that when our works are burned up, we'll actually you know, if if we've done works in pride, if we've done them in uh, self-aggrandizement or whatever it might be, um, it'll actually be shown and exposed at the final day of judgment. And that'll cause us to weep. Um, that that will be a sad thing to see that happen. So that would be sort of the the one thought there. So that's sort of how the Reformed are thinking about salvation as, as a reward. Um, the second thing I'd want to bring up would be... Um, that's fair enough. So like, yes. Yeah, so you mentioned the fact that there's a lot of facts in Revelation that are a mystery. And I would agree. Um, but at the same time, it does. So in my mind, and, and we're getting, we're, we tread on dangerous territory when we use language like that, right? Because we're creatures. <laughs> yeah. But um, with that caveat, um, the, reform, the reformers objection to, to this idea was that it magnifies, wouldn't it magnify the merits of Christ to cover our sin, especially when, at least, when we think about the order of justice, if justice can be can be duly satisfied, the temporal debts can be cleared away, someone lives 90 years of sin, you know, they get baptized and they die the next day, they go straight to heaven, the missionary, you know, has certain temporal debts that they accrue, Um if we can say, okay, well, baptism can take that away, and so there's nothing about the the order of justice necessarily that would be violated in applying the merits of Christ, because in both cases it's the merits of Christ that cover the temporal debt of punishment. Wouldn't it magnify the merits of Christ more if the merits were applied just by repenting? And that doesn't exclude the practice of holiness, uh, but wouldn't it magnify the merits of Christ and the sufficiency of Christ? for those to for his merits to be applied to the temporal debt of punishment in every case of repentance yeah so uh so let's deal with that in order um yeah. so the first thing about the way that the reform talk about w rewards and things um so this is where you know the catholic is going to want to maintain a realness or a reality to the to the merit and reward transaction in other words um just like a, you know when we talk about uh meriting rewards okay that is talking about doing a certain work god looks at the work and whatever its value is and then pays it right mm -hmm. but you know where the reformed are tempted to go is is to get away from like they'll admit that okay keep the language mm -hmm. but what's really ontologically going on yes yeah. and all that's really all that's really ontologically going on here is whatever my condition is by the time mm -hmm. i die my everlasting condition in heaven is just correspondent to the real to the singular ontological condition that i was in when i died and so now the merit and reward uh uh concept is unreal it's unreal because you know now it's just a one-to-one -one reality you know you've you've done enough good works you've prayed You've uh, worshipped God daily, um, talking about the big cups. You know, in other words, you yourself have attuned your soul, like like First 
P Peter says, you've added knowledge, you've added brotherly love, you've sure. added all these things to your life yeah. so that so that an abundance, um, the, the, the kingdom of God, an entrance into the kingdom of God is abundantly provided to you. So then you, you just sort of walk into a condition that you've already been in. You know, or that you that you've suited yourself to, and I yeah. think it kind of removes the reality of you know parables like the talents, right? Where yeah. you've got a quant, you got you you have recipients of a quantity, yeah. You know, uh, talents. You know, one talent, five talent, ten talents, and they are they are supposed to be industrious with those mm -hmm. with those talents sure. and and then once once um once the judge returns to see how industrious they've been with the talents um there's a differentiation some some sure. produce 30 fold some produce 60 fold right and um and their rewards are going to be you know corresponding to that sure. i i just don't know i just i i think that by trying to say that well, whatever I've got my soul to be like by the time I die, that's what my rewards are going to be. It's not as if God sees value in me and then bestows a like a top layer added grace or a top layer added reward. The reward is what I am. You see what I'm saying? I, sure. I, I, th I, I think that by making it ontologically singular like that, um it makes it makes no sense of the text sure. in, in sure. scripture the, yeah and, and then the second thing the second yeah, yeah. yeah go ahead i just wanted to address the first thing and then the second thing yeah. about um the uh what well, the, the the second thing you had mentioned was the i, I just Would forgot. magnify the merits of christ oh, the magnify the merits of christ yeah so it, i think we could go a step further you know why don't we just magnify the merits of Christ by saving everybody without anything, sure. without, without any repentance and without? Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. So at least there with that question, um, Edwards talks about, and we mentioned last time, Edwards talks about faith as the act of unition, the souls uniting to Christ. So the only way I think you and I agree that the only way this can't be a legal fiction you know, is if there's a real union between the believer in Christ. Otherwise, it is it is unjust uh, because God is counting something as true that's not. Uh, but given that that uh, imputation and the sharing in Christ status needs something ontologically binding the believer to, to Christ, then we have to ask, what is that? What, what is it that binds the believer to Christ? And of course, that response is faith. Faith is the soul's unition to, to Jesus. Um, so that would be why... Um, I would say it wouldn't magnify his merits in that sense, because um, apart from faith, one isn't united to him. Faith is is the, the embodiment of our united or the embodiment, the um, the way we are united to Christ in the soul. Now, couldn't couldn't a Catholic just say that charitable construction in the soul is also uh, a reflection of yeah, the way question. that it's binding? Yeah. And yeah. so to, to, to the to the degree that one soul is uh contrary wise yeah good question that, you know yeah um, yeah yeah and gustavo gutierrez tries to go that direction um in, so does you know, he? Okay. in a theology of liberty yeah so he actually tries to say that it's actually part of the justification for um the phrase to do justice is to know god he tries to argue i don't think successfully but he tries to argue from vatican II that the secret knowledge is embodied. And so it can be embodied in the practice of justice. Um, Interesting. I, I, I wouldn't go that route. No, 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 no. And I'm not, I don't think, yeah, I, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think that Roman sounds disgusting. That route either. Yeah. Um, but um, so yeah, could, could a Roman Catholic say that love itself, like to some extent unites you to Christ? I would say no. And this goes to the Protestant understanding of, Anything, you know, quoting Paul, anything that does not proceed from faith is sin. And so, it, it, and this would be the sort of rebuttal to, to the Council of Trent, that the, the claim that there is nothing we can do uh, prior to justification except sin uh, to some extent or another, because whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. 
And the reason for that, there are things outside of Christ that are more or less disordered, you know, so right. it, it's less disordered to idolize your wife than to, you know, um, idolize your nation to the extent that you would burn the Jews, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the, the, the pagan or the atheist who loves their family is less disordered by far than Hitler, like for sure. But um, we would want to say both are still disordered. And, and so true order actually only happens in the wake of faith. Uh, and I think that would be justified by this claim that whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Yeah, so I, I definitely don't want to say that there's a possibility of love outside of this bond of communion between yeah. Christ and the and the and the believer. So, um, what what I would say is that the infusion. Let me let me back up here just a little bit here to speak about yeah. something because one of the things that gets missing, I think, it, at least it was missing in the days of. Um, like the new perspective debates and then yeah. the uh, um, Norman Shepard and the federal vision debate days. One of the things that got missed was the, this fundamental, I think, biblical assumption and patristic assumption that the justification of the soul happens in sacramental baptism. Sure. Yep. You know, and this is yep. something that, you know, you know, so that actually changes the, it, there's a reason why Westminster guys and London Baptist Confession guys. Uh, now, when I say Westminster, I know some of the guys are listening who are strong reformed are going to have a problem with that. I don't mean to talk about every Presbyterian, but mm -hmm. definitely the ones in the last 30 years that have been evangelistic. I'm talking about D. James Kennedy, um, R.C. Sproul, you know, some of these voices that have occupied an influence in our in yeah. our generation um they don't like looking at this thing of justification as a sacramental baptistic right. thing right yep. and the reason why the reason why is because that or that brings in the dimension of the ecclesia who's yep. doing the baptizing yeah and then yep. this goes back this goes back to hierarchical commission where jesus says go into the world make disciples of all nations baptizing them and so you've got baptizers on the other end of justification and it's like oh my goodness we cannot have that you know yeah. um but it especially look it, it's especially poignant when it comes to infants because mm -hmm. because they're especially um the early church you know construct they when i say constructed i don't mean they made it up but they yeah. constructed the the concept of a witness or mm -hmm. a sponsor, you know, somebody who's going to answer in their stead. Yeah. Um, Augustine thought it was because the faith of the church uh, was involved in the salvation of the infant. Yeah. But when you are justified in this baptismal act, it's not just faith alone. And this is where, this is where guys like, uh, Jordan Cooper have done uh, good work in in making clear that you know guys like Jimmy Aiken and, and some other Catholic theologians who when they say oh sola fide yeah we could we could talk we could say sola fide um, Jordan Cooper has done I think a good job of kind of getting us back to reality here because we don't actually think it's just faith yeah. all by itself yep. Um, because we define faith in Catholic systematics, especially in scholastic systematics, as believing things are certain, you know, believing yeah. things are true. Yeah. That's not going to be what the Book of Concord says faith is. It's right. not going to be what the Westminster Confession says. So we understand faith in that way. So with the infusion of that alone, there cannot be a washing regenerative union with the mystical body of Christ. Yep. Yep. So there, there has to be a vital change yep. in the person. Um, and we're still talking about a little baby here. Yep. Okay. So this is why faith, charity, and hope being the, the three theological virtues, those are the virtues infused into the soul that elevate the soul um to be 
uh, what what the Bible calls uh, the new creature or mm -hmm. the justified man. Yeah, you know. Um, so I would simply say about this question about the shining of Christ's merits, we all agree that just letting everybody live like the days before Noah, the flood. Just letting everybody live to their sin, to their heart's content. And at the end, God says, oh, by the way, there's this crucifixion that happened. Nobody knew about it. I had it worked out. All these merits are going to come and just completely wash everybody and instantaneously change everybody so that everybody can go into heaven, right? Um, some people might make an argument. There's, I'm sure there's some right. philosophers out there who might make an argument, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, philosophy of religion. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. so you and I would not go that route. So then you said that uh, you brought up the Edwardsian idea of the unitive principle mm -hmm. of faith, and I would say that um, if what you mean by unitive principle of faith is this concept of yearning for God through faith. <laughs> I would say you got what I understand by love already packed in there, hidden. Um, well, yes, but but Edwards would want. So I think one of the key differences, and tell me, tell me what what you think about this too, is that um, on the Roman Catholic perspective, when hope, charity, and the the virtues are infused in faith, that sort of uh, that is the outworking of infused righteousness. Uh, whereas, and we're going to pick at straws, but I'll explain why this is relevant or split hairs, but I'll explain why this is relevant in a second. Um, whereas in the Protestant perspective, so Edwards actually does affirm, and he actually gets pushback from, for this. Know, he affirms yeah. that love is a part, is a constitutive right. part of faith. Um, I think he's right <laughs> um, because there's something different about the faith that justifies than the faith that doesn't. So I think Edwards is absolutely right. Um, but he would say that this is sort of grace that that God causes in the heart that binds you to Christ. And so this faith that is effective in love is sort of the, you can think of it as the, the visible instantiation of God's work. So to parse this out in reform soteriology, some reform people will say regeneration precedes faith. That's not the way Calvin talks. Uh, Calvin talks about uh, regeneration as actually encompassing this whole process of, you know, you're dead and then you're, you come alive to God, which includes the bringing into faith in your heart. So within that process, if regeneration is the turning of the self to God, right, uh, the, the role of the spirit there is to give faith in the heart, uh, which is a part of the process of regeneration, um, and then through faith that's given in the heart, uh, in that faith, one grasps Christ. So Luther, in Two Kinds of Righteousness, talks about Christ as the form of faith. Um, so love and with love and hope overflowing from that. The idea there is faith grasps Christ. Um, and it is a faith that's effective through love. But nevertheless, the, what justifies about faith isn't actually anything about faith, but about the one to whom faith binds you, yeah. namely Christ. Uh, yeah, so I, that so, would be one. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, so yeah, I understand where Edwards is going with yeah. that, and uh, and I and I have, I've read material where people have said, "Look, this guy's getting close to Rome," um, <laughs> and uh, of course, you know, uh, John Gershner has he wrote a book trying to defend. Um, I actually have that book by Gershner. Yeah defending Edwards from that charge. But uh, yeah. you've got good guys that have been able to point out that uh, uh, that he, he he certainly has a, uh, this, this element in him. What I would say is that um, I think he's making, dif he's making distinctions where there doesn't need to be one. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and here's why uh, I'll, I'll just want to present my screen here with, yeah. you know, the, why it is that, a Catholic would want to make a distinction here. And this is because, um, you know, what is the grounds of our justification? The Catholic is this, we don't want to just slip into this idea that the justice and the faith or the faith and the charity and the hope that's infused into the soul all of a sudden becomes the ground of our being righteous, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's what it sounds like. That's what mm -hmm. it sounds like. We're always we always got to keep reminding ourselves that in Catholic theology, and 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 
this goes for other theologies. Um, it's consistently the passion and resurrection of Jesus that mm -hmm. merits the, the gift of justification. But when justification is given to us in form, right, which is different than meritorious causation. And I know this is, you know, we're bringing in, we're bringing in distinctions from a pagan philosopher here that so many That's people okay. criticize for me about. Yeah. Um, I've heard it more than once already in uh, my, my articles and everything. But um, when so it comes funny. to form, you know, I, I'm just, <laughs> something isn't bad because it's a non-Christian. Right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, when it comes to form, um, you know, th this is not, we're not tapping again back into the the meritorious grounds, right? Here we're just talking about the form that it takes when we are justified, and this, you know, the the reformed theologians like you're like you're you're presenting here, um, even faith itself is not like a ground. All it's yeah. doing is is hooking us into this yep. much greater matrix of Jesus. Yeah. Um, and yeah. but but let's look at Romans eight here because I think Paul Paul gives us this idea here where the ontological quality that we take on as a regenerate and washed and sanctified person is forming the right the justifying righteousness. So you know in verse one here. Um, uh, there is now no condemnation. Now, no condemnation is, you know, just another way of saying uh, justification. You know, mm -hmm. um, yep. so there is there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So we're all on the same page. Yep. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Right. For so it gives us a reason. Okay, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is still talk. I would argue that this liberation from the law of sin is we're still talking about the ontological quality of the human. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do. Okay, let's emphasize could not do here. All right, if this if this thing can disappear, that would help. Uh, could not do. Um, we have to ask ourselves, what is that? Yep. Uh, and is 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 it, it was the law impotent to create a um, a meritorious grounds outside of us, or was it it was a failure to make into in us uh, a pleasing specimen to God, uh, in that it was weak through the flesh. That's why. That's what it says. That it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending His own Son, in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. That's the cross. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now we've we've all seen this millions of times, right? Um, but it's interesting to note that a lot of reformed commentaries, uh, including Douglas Moo. And I, I'm surprised he took this route, but that the requirement that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, um, he takes that to mean basically the imputation of Christ's yeah. righteousness. Um, mm -hmm. And I I understand, you know, how somebody can get there. I don't. I think you could be a genius and still get there. But I think there's good reasons to not believe that. I think, and and, and the context here kind of hints in that direction yep. based on Romans 7 and what comes afterwards. I want to point out one more thing, and and then I'll let you uh, respond to that. Okay, so yep. the, the, only, the other thing I want to say here is... Um, uh, so, so, so this here, okay, we're, this here applies to the baby that is in is that is uh justified now paul probably was not thinking of a baby being baptized here sure. um but in, just so we make you know we're trying to make catholic systematic theology which went into the council of trent clear 
we're we make this whole paragraph work for a baby because of the infusion of the three virtues together not one being some kind of an instrumental link to christ who's the greater uh, form of righteousness formal cause of yeah. righteousness but this is still talking about the ontological quality of of the sinner so the the, the last point you know i, I want to make here is this part um if the body if christ is in you the body is dead because of sin but the spirit is life because of righteousness and this is a very important point to make because this dikaya sunane right here mm -hmm. i i understand this to be the same dikaya sunane in romans 1 16 17 romans 3 21 Ro romans 3 uh uh, 25 Romans 4 1 through 25 Romans 5 1 through 12 Romans 6 1 through 23 in other words I don't view and this is replete in reform commentaries they'll try to make a distinction here with this Dikaya Sunane this is talking about a moral ethical Dikaya Sunane which is to be sharply contrasted with the forensic Dikaya Sunane of the law court that comes up at the beginning of Romans I would say that's one of the fundamental paradigms that causes reformed readers to consistently stay looped into the, their understanding of the ordo salutis. Sure. But, and, and this is not this is is not unheard of. I, I have um, a reformed, not a reformed, but a Lutheran commentator on Romans who came out and said that. This is one of the biggest problems of Reformation exegesis of Romans is that the Dikaya Sunane of Romans 6 through 8 has been conceptually, ontologically distinguished. However much indissolubly connected, it's been conceptually distinguished from the Dikaya Sunane in Romans 1 to 5. And, and the reason why I say this, and I only got about 30 seconds left here, is look at what he says. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life. What is this life? That's, that's the very life that have, that Romans, you know, Romans 1 16, the, the gospel is the power of God unto the salvation of everyone who believes because the, you know, the just shall live by faith. Or how about in Romans 5, where he says that just as one man, just as the judgment which resulted from one man resulted in death, so also the gift of justice from the one man resulted in life or glory. This life here in Romans 8.10 is talking about the same result. And yet he gives a because of righteousness, which is clearly in the context of this ontological reality and we're still talking about a baby remember we're not talking about somebody who's going around uh preaching the gospel doing good works we're still just talking about a baby who's infused with justice that the the that body is dead so my my baby my last baby when he was baptized um, right after he was baptized and he had that beautiful oil all over him and he smelled like, you know, the best thing in the world. But what Paul's saying here applies to him too. That little body is dead because of sin, but, but the spirit is life because of what is because of righteousness or justification. Um, that's the infusion of what Paul's saying here in this whole context is that soul has been reordered to become a vital living member of Christ's body, which cannot be by faith alone uniting us, but it, all, it must be by faith informed by charity and hope, which reorients the entire soul to God sure. such that, yeah, such that yeah. it's, so it, it's a righteous soul. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So that's really helpful. That gives us a lot, a lot to work with. So in Romans 8, 4, um, so you're right, certain reformed exegetes will try to take that as a reference to imputation. I don't think that works, but interestingly, neither does like Tom Schreiner or John Piper. Right. 
Yeah. Um, and so both of them want to actually do say, yeah, that's actually a functional requirement. But the key phrase in Romans 8, 1 is, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk according to uh, according to the spirit, not according to the flesh. So the key thing there is that who is identifying sort of the external feature of the one for whom there is no condemnation. And then what, what I would add from an Anglican perspective is to say that um, I'm okay with talking about liberation even as a presupposition of justification, right? So if justification is uh, the aspect in which we share in Christ's title to eternal life on account of being united to Jesus, on account of his indwelling in us, well, then that presupposes a, a liberation that happens such that one cannot be liberated without being justified, nor can one be justified without being liberated. So they're, they're sort of inseparably bound up together, such that if you have one, you have the other. And in pointing to one, you can point to the other because of their inseparable link. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. so two, two more, two more questions there. No, go I also want to say that the, the um, dikaiao verb to justify does seem to have a more technical use uh, both in extra biblical literature and in the Old Testament. So, uh, you know, when Paul says in Romans 4 that God justifies the ungodly, it seems like he's actually echoing language to emphasize the scandal of it uh, from Exodus, where this is the exact thing, you know, the, the Pentateuch says that God doesn't do. He doesn't justify the ungodly. Yeah, Paul's saying he does. Uh, so what's going on there? Well, I think that Paul's saying that God does because he's counting righteousness to the believer. So he's regarding righteousness to, to the person who believes. And then in Romans 4, um, right beneath Romans 4, 5, that gets parsed out in terms of counting one as an heir. So if they're counted righteous, they're counted as one who's an heir to eternal life. And then we'll, we'll, we parse that out in terms of union with Christ, in terms of how does that make systematic sense. Um, so that would be the first thing I'd want to say. I also want to respond really quick to an earlier point, um, namely that if the reward of eternal life is this organic outgrowth of the practice of holiness, um, then that both um, that sort of suggests not this, uh, it doesn't do justice to the passages which speak of God's external reward uh, for, uh, for a life of holiness. Now, I'd want to say two things there. Uh, first, the spirit, in, on reformed soteriology is the one who produces that that obedience in us and so even the obedience itself is grace um, so yet not i but the grace of god that is with me is, is what accounts for paul's working harder than than uh his fellow apostles i'd also want to say that uh you know the the master in the parable comes back and gives like a city or 10 cities or something like that i would say that grace has fitted them for that for the rule of that city. So we could think about, yeah, there, there's, they're ruling a city. At, at the end, we'll all be raised from the dead in material bodies, right? And so there's there's a way in which virtue actually fits us for the role that we'll have in the new heavens and the new earth, the redeemed creation. Yeah. Um, and so that's where then that concept of external reward would come, but it would, it would be uh, given in accord with the way the spirit has fitted the soul for that external reward. And the, the last thing, this is a really quick point that I'd want yeah. to point out, is um, Luther, as, as you know, actually, he did want to say that babies have faith. And now, that's, yeah. that sounds really strange. That sounds really weird. Uh, but, you know, N.T. Wright once said this, th this thing that has stuck with me. He's like, do we think that the God who made stars and rainbows and all this stuff can't communicate whales? He can't communicate with a baby. Oh, mm -hmm. um, of course he can. Uh, in a mode that's fitted to the baby. Um, and so in the Protestant understanding, this is where Luther's idea comes in of in baptism, God actually gives faith. And the reason Luther makes that move is because he's seeing these texts that mention justification by faith alone, and yet he's also sensitive to the text that says baptism un unites you to Christ. And so the, the only way to fit those together, it seems, is to say, yeah, baptism is the sacrament of faith. And there's precedent for that in Augustine that, that Luther points to. Uh, so I, that's the route Anglicans would generally take, too, um, is to say that baptism is the sacrament in which God gives faith, even in the baby, faith sufficient to unite their soul to Christ. Those are sort of the three things that, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So let me go and reverse to respond yeah. to those. So, so yeah, I mean, we Catholics also believe in the infusion mm -hmm. of of the gift of faith. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 given in into the soul, um, and and according to the mode of the baby, but it's something that is uh, it does require external nurture. You know, yes, because yep. because yep. you know, if an infant's baptized and then grows up in a, an entirely unchristian environment, yep. it's not it's not as if he's going to have some sort of known apprehension of the cross, the yep. resurrection, right? Um, okay. Yep. The second thing about the blessing, you know, the merit and and, and reward thing, you know, that it, it, that what we eventually get rewarded with is fitting to the state and condition i would say yes you know i, I wouldn't say that it's it, you know m the position that i'm espousing requires it to be some sort of like random and some sort of uh no i i think that it it is going to be proportionate you know um so but i still think that it you know the reward and the uh the merit and reward aspect of it still applies you know, in that regard. So it's not as if that's cast away or reinterpreted as simply just an ontological effect of where I'm at when I die. I think that um, what we get rewarded with is going to be decided by God. You know, we will be fit sure. for it, but it may be different for different persons based upon the actual reward itself. And, sure. and so that sure. that that does get into this issue of God deciding what to reward who with and what not. Um, yeah. And then the last thing, the first the, the first thing about, uh, you know, Romans eight, you know, or, or some some, you know, like Calvin, I think, did take Romans eight four to be the real, you know, yep. fulfilling the the life of God in us through the yeah. through the uh, keeping of commandments. Um that just it, that just it highlights where where Catholics and Ortho, Catholics and Protestants disagree on the the reading of these texts because in in my reading of these texts Romans seven is talking about a person who is living under condemnation you know Romans seven one through five it talks about the the passions ruling over the person leading to bearing fruits of death. Whereas now through Christ, be, having died to the law, we bear fruit to God. Um, that transition there is not just uh, identifying justification or identifying the person who's justified. It's describing the justification. Um, because the transition from death to life is not a descriptive that's associated with justification it is the justification you know so so when when paul says there is now no condemnation for those who are in christ who do not walk according it's talking sure. about it's talking about why there is no condemnation sure in in those so it's not just uh it's not just a statement about you know a justification which is sitting on top of otherwise grounds and then a description afterwards that has nothing to do with those grounds but happens to be inextricably des described about the persons who have it it seems to me and i just can't get over it, it just seems to sure. me like a foreign reading of what sure. paul's getting at yeah. In Romans 6, I'm assuming you're getting sort of the identification of like justification and the transition from life to death. Uh, Romans 6, uh, for um, he who God, has died, yeah, has been justified from sin. I, I, so I, I actually don't take, I, I actually don't, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but no, no. I don't, I don't take that word for justif justified in Romans 6, 3, and 4 as, uh, as 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 actually like I think it just means liberated. I don't think it means what he means elsewhere with the decay. Oh, so yeah. you would actually take that as different than I think so. I, I, yeah, I think so. I think in my book um, I show hesitation because I never really was convinced um, with you know somebody taking advantage of 
uh, I forgot how it's cognated there. Dikaya, uh, it's longer than I thought. Yeah, it's it's an uh, Eris passive. Um, yeah. Uh, third person singular. Yeah, I, I I think we could I think we could I, I think we could just leave it as set free. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so I'll bracket that point just for the sake of time. Yeah. Um, in that case, then where where do you see in Romans the identification of justification with? Because I agree, Romans six is talking about a transition from death to life that's functional and practical. Um, and Romans six is talking about the holiness that results from that. And so it makes sense that Romans eight is picking up on that theme, uh, but where do you where do you get the identification of justification with the transition? Yeah, so uh, in Romans, I would take it from uh, chapter. Uh, I would take it from chapter six to eight. So I would say that the the life that we are expected to enjoy from the righteousness that Romans 1, 17 talks about, Romans 3, 21, Romans 4, 1 through 25, you know. Romans 5, really, you know, Romans 5, I'll tell you a verse real quick. I'm just flipping over. This has got to be one of my most marked up um, Bibles with me. So um, yeah. I'm a little, I'll just show, just for, just to show you what this looks like on this version of, uh, in fact, when I showed this, when I showed this to some Catholics, um, <laughs> they they were furious with me yeah. that, that mm -hmm. I wrote that I wrote in God's Word. But okay, so but the problem is now I can't read. <laughs> There's some Lutherans who um, would be upset with that too. Yeah. Okay. Romans five one, um, and he talks about glory. He talks about glory. Uh, yes. Verse 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So this glory here, I I take this to have a very special motif in Paul. Um, so 2 Corinthians 3, for example, mm -hmm. you know, Glory, we beholding the glory of the Lord are yeah. transformed from glory to glory. Um, sure. Romans 8, when he talks about this, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in verse 18, yeah. uh, Romans 8, 18, he says, for I consider the sufferings of this present time. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. 17. Um, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together with him. So I take I take glory to be just eternal life. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And, but I, and, I, yeah. And so I, I, yeah, yeah, so in in Romans in Romans six, seven, and eight, Paul says that eternal life is re what's requisite for that is overcoming this problem. Yes. Of 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 being dead in sin, yes. of being a slave yeah. to a slave to sin and things like that. You cannot have eternal life mm -hmm. while that condition remains. Sure. And sure. so and so in and the way I approach uh, the way I read that is the transition from being dead in sin to being alive to God is functionally a justifying event. And not mm -hmm. just an, an inextricable, indissoluble side gift, sure, or sure. or uh, to be distinguished from the real thing yeah. that justifies us. Yeah, you see what yeah. I'm saying? There's yeah. no reason in my reading. There's no mm -hmm. reason to to make that distinction. So it seems to me. So there are a couple things going on there. So it seems to me that. Uh, when Paul in Romans five says we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, I would I would say yeah that's that's functional that's transformative, but then that would be conceived sort of along reformed lines as the telos. So we're united to Christ. That's that's what justifies. That is something ontological that happens to us. You know through union with Christ we have a new nature. Absolutely, but what justifies us is the union itself. 
And the telos of that justification is participation in the glory of God. So the Reformed yes. have always wanted to say that the, the point, the, the goal of salvation is, or the goal of justification is obedience unto salvation, which the Lutherans have been very uncomfortable saying. Right. Um, and that's been one of the divides. But I think that's, so I would be happy saying that's true. Um, but it seems to, at least to me, that when Paul says, um, the promise to Abraham and his offspring in Romans 4.13, uh, uh, that he would be an heir of the world, did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith, that then Dikai Sune, uh, it's being used there as that through which the promise comes. And so when I'm thinking about the use of Dikai Sune in Romans, there seem to be a number of categories we have to make clear. So Dikai Sune Theyu in Romans 1.16 uh, through 18. Um, so that's the righteousness of God. And so that's that's one phrase we have to deal with. Um, okay, so then there's this righteousness of faith phrase that we have to deal with. And then there's just Dikai Sune proper that we'd have to deal with. Uh, you know, I would be okay with saying that Dikai Sune proper in like Romans 6 through 8. Um, yeah, that's, you know, that's fair that that means um, practical righteousness. But the the kind of what the reformers will argue, and I, th I think they're right, the new perspective notwithstanding, <laughs> um, is that Dikai Sune Theyu is what's imputed to the believer, which roughly then will correspond to the righteousness of faith. That's what's given through the righteousness of faith, because it's that which uh, it's emphasized as that which gives us uh, heirship, that which makes us heirs of the Abrahamic promise. Um, so that you know. It, I, I would be okay with saying, yeah, Romans 6 through 8 is practical, but that doesn't seem then to bear on the question of, but justification as its identification, um, what is justification picking out? And it seems in Romans 4, um, 13 and following, it's picking out uh, this idea of being qualified to be an heir. That seems the, like what qualifies you to share in the promise. That The answer to that seems to be being justified. Right. So, right. so, so the righteousness of Romans four is what grounds our ability to have eternal life. Yes. Yes. Great. So in Luther's two kinds of righteousness then, which, so I, I yes, I would absolutely affirm that. Now in that two kinds of righteousness idea, you actually find Luther saying that as well. And uh, what I'd want to say then is that justification grounds our ability to have eternal life because eternal life is participation in the life of God, right? It's not just being justified. It's not just, um, it's not even just being sanctified. It's this idea of pressing into the life of God, right? And, and bearing his glory and reflecting his glory into the world. So I would agree, yes, but then the righteousness that justifies in Romans 4 is that which qualifies us to be an heir. That's sort of the referent of that. That yeah, yeah, I get it. I know. And in, in in my reading, I think it's a it's a distinction that doesn't need to be there because yeah. Romans Roman six through eight, as as we agree, yeah, says that in order to be an heir of eternal life, you have to be regenerated. Sure. You know, sure. you have to be regenerated. And this is not just side by side with what qualifies us to be an heir. It is what qualifies us to be an heir. Because if you look at uh, like Romans 6, for example, um, Romans 6, uh, verse uh, 21. Mm -hmm. All right. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? Mm -hmm. For the end of those things is death. So in order to be an heir of death, or an uh, heir of death is not the right phrase. In order to be a wage recipient of death, you, you sin for, for it, right? And that's what he's going to yeah. say. Uh, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, and again, that doesn't mean activity. That's sure. just talking about an ontological change. Sure. Um, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end e everlasting life. Sure. So he, Luther looks at this and says, "Well, we gotta we gotta incorporate this too." 
Yeah. Um, so we'll have the righteousness that qualify, qualifies us to be an heir. But then Paul says all these other things about, you know, we can't really have, we can't really be an heir without also the righteousness of, uh, you know, moral, ethical living. And so what we'll do is we'll differentiate them. So that way one's procured, you know, completely without works and the other one is works. Sure. And I, I just don't see that in, I don't see no. that in the tech, especially in the text of Romans 8, where uh, we're told that if you fail to put to death the deeds of yes. the body, yeah. you'll die. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the typical, the typical uh, reformed explanation for that is here once again. It's not talking about the ground of our justification. It's simply talking about somebody who, um, you know, somebody who loses their salvation is showing that they were never. Um, they were never in the whole process of salvation, you know, because they didn't complete it, yeah. you know, where, whereas I, I, I don't think, I think that that's a forced, it's, it's, sure. it's forced into um, Paul's idea here. And, and in, it, you know, Rome, I think what, gra what, what, what Luther saw, it, it all comes back to Romans four, because in my book, it all comes back to sure. Romans four. Yeah, the Reformation yeah. exegesis sees a completely workless justification of the ungodly. Yeah, so I want to. So I want to follow up. Yeah. I actually, we have five yeah. minutes. Okay, no problem. Um, but but um, yeah. So in the so yeah. So with reformed exegesis, so sort of, I think you're right. Luther does make some moves that at least aren't systematized well. In the Reformed exegesis, it's and it sounds like you're equating eternal life with justification, whereas Reformed exegesis would want to say where justification is the possession to the title to eternal life, you come into possession of the title through the life of holiness. So the the analogy often used in Pilgrim's Progress, this gets used even though I don't particularly like Pilgrim's Progress, just okay. think it's heavy-handed. <laughs> like, but what what gets used in that idea is that. Um, uh, I believe what Pilgrim has, he has this title yeah. to an inheritance and then he makes a journey to yeah. essentially like cash in that title. So justification is having the title. Whereas in the reformed reading, uh, the life of holiness is the way to, in which we come into possession of the title. Uh, we obtain the title to eternal life, but we come into possession of what the title promises through the life of holiness. So with that perspective, then, the mention of eternal life, and, and that does seem textually fair to me, that the mention of eternal life there has to be conceptually distinguished from justification, because justification presumes the law court, whereas eternal life doesn't always presume the law court. So we have to draw those, those lines differently. And insofar then as justification is talking about a law court, uh, then we can talk about, okay, like what's the case being tried? And in Romans 4, it seems to be, does this person have the title to Abraham's promise. Now in Romans 6 to 8, you can sort of see the reformed thinking of saying, yeah, and you come into possession of that title of the promise through the life of holiness. But Romans 4 then is identifying like, on what basis are you an heir? On what basis do you possess the right to the promise? Yeah, I think that conceptual scheme makes a good deal of sense of the progression of, of the thought here. Yeah, so that and that, that's just, just where we would, you know, disagree. <laughs> um, because I, I think, you know, and, and in my defense, you know, I would simply say that, you know, righteousness is so close. It's so close. And, you know, Romans 5 especially um, talks about dikaiosune without the genitive of tu theu or tu pistu. Uh, it's just talking about righteousness, dikaiosune, the gift of righteousness that comes through the second Adam uh, versus the sin um, or the transgression of Adam. Uh, and usually, uh, Reformed folks will define Dikaiosune in Romans 5, 12 to 21 as the imputed righteousness. But then in Romans 6, thir uh, 15, you know, which, which when, when Paul was dictating this, could have, couldn't have been more than, you know, 40 seconds later. Sure. <laughs> um, 
he starts talking about Dikai Sune, uh not only in the moral ethical sense, but in in the in the ontological being. Sure. You know, just like the just like the baby who is 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 sentenced to death in Adam. You know, this is why I brought up infant baptism because yeah. it, it it illustrates the point. You know, a, an infant hasn't done anything uh, to to ethically live out the kind of righteousness that Romans six through eight talks about. Sure, but we would still, nevertheless, say that all of that does apply to the infant. Yep. yep. Because because we're talking about a quality of state, not just the works that come out of it. So that's really so that's that's helpful. I would actually say we are talking about the works that come out of it because when we think about eternal life holistically, it includes our eschatological state. We won't like we won't stop obeying God in right, the eschatological right. state. Yeah. And so the righteousness require uh, the righteous requirement of the law will be fulfilled practically actually in the baby's life as well. Because when the baby's raised from the dead and even in the intermediate immediate state in the worship of God the baby is actually obeying and, and is is living into a life of obedience. Yeah, right. But what we would say is like a, a baby who dies, you know, a baptized baby who dies, um, we would say that that soul has been fundamentally changed from its disposition in Adam, such that now it has all the equipment for everlasting life. That's why a baptized baby, and it, it, he the baptized baby instantly goes to heaven because all the equipment that would have been given if Adam and Eve succeeded in the trial in the garden of Eden has been given to the baby. Right. So when Adam, if Adam and Eve, for example, passed the test, yeah. they would have entered into immortality and all of their children, the sacrament of baptism would simply be seminally, uh, delivered in reproduction, right? And so yeah. each each reproduced baby, without works of the law, without works of their own, would be produced, w equipped for the life of an Edenic world, right? So we would say that a baby, you know, without works, is given the equipment so that, and, and when I say equipment, I mean sanctifying grace, yeah. Um so that it that baby has the title deed to heaven he that baby's not going to work it out in this life it's going to be fulfilled like in, like you said in, in eschatological life but um we would say everything that paul's talking about in romans 6 to 8 applies to the baby who hasn't done anything yet so would you want to say the reason the baby has the title to eternal life is because the baby has the equipment to le live an idyllic life. That's that's why this is th that's why Adam was kicked out of the garden was because you know he he because of the sin because of sin he his soul was fundamentally reordered towards self, right? Sure. So yeah. the the title deed itself is purchased by the blood of Christ, but the form that it takes. So we're, we're getting away from talking about grounds now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the, the 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 title deed is only per it's it's only merited by the blood of Christ. Yeah. But the form that it takes is the equipment that gives the soul its heightened the, this heightened glorification deification yeah. so that it can communicate with God as a friend. Okay. Gotcha. You know. Last question, and then I gotta, yeah. I gotta head no out. But I wish we could continue this because this has yeah, yeah. yeah, been great. Um, but last question, then, um, would you say then that the, let's say, going back to that example of the ninety-year-old, like the ninety-year-old lives this life of sin, but then gets baptized and then dies the day, you know, dies shortly after, and gets baptized genuinely and and all this stuff. But, um, you know, he has faith. He wants to be baptized. He's repentant. Um, you know, he gets baptized. Um, then he dies. Um, would he have better uh, uh, better equipment than, let's say, the person who's lived their whole life? Uh, would, would that – but has, has venially sinned along the way and, and – would, would would the ninety year old have better equipment for eternal life than 
the the missionary? That's a good question. So I would say the missionary who's lived their life, but they've had struggles and venial yeah. sins and all that. We have we can't forget that the the daily prayers, the daily tears, the daily works that they're doing are also yeah. are also yeah. covering them. Right. You know, right. and so who knows? You know what where they're going to be at the end of their life. Um, their merits will all be collected. So yeah. um, the ninety year old who had a day to live as a Christian, a baptized Christian, um, they both have the same equipment, sanctifying grace. Yeah, that's going to get them into heaven. But I would say a missionary is going to have several more merits, yeah. um, even if there is some venial sin that hasn't been canceled out from yeah. that life of service. Um, all that life of service will will be proportionately repaid in the reward of heaven uh, or what their rewards yeah. are in heaven. That's helpful. Yeah. I, I would love to continue this. I, so I do, I do have to get going. Oh, that's okay. Um, we could do a third part. <laughs> that would be amazing. Yeah. And I would love maybe in part three, if we just like take the texts and then go like Romans three through four and then Galatians two through three. Absolutely. That, that I, think that be, I think that would be, I think that would be, excellent yeah cool great yeah. well yeah we'll plan on that thank you so much for having me eric yeah this no, has been thank you it, yeah this is great this is great okay all right everybody if you could like subscribe share um pray for sean pray for me and uh we'll do this again next time god bless you Blessings.